Hey everyone, Michael like Douglas Bartholomew Reginald Esquire the Fourth here, and this is a guide to making a character in the Pathfinder video games. If you've never played a D20 style game before, this can be a bit imposing, and I'm gonna try to fix that. When starting a new game, it will give you difficulty settings. I highly recommend turning off auto level up for companions. The rest of these settings are just fine for your first playthrough. Next, you'll have the option of using a pre-generated character or choosing a custom one. Since the purpose of this video is to show you how to make a character, we're going to pick a custom one. Portrait. You can use a portrait included in the game, or you can upload your own. There is a fantastic pack on NexusMods.com that gives you a few thousand options. I'll link that in the description if you would like it. Next, we choose our class. At this point, we need to decide what type of gameplay we're going for. Archery. A tank. A swordsman. A rage-fueled powerhouse an alchemist who drinks elixirs and throws bombs, a bard who boosts her allies with music, a cavalier who rides their mount into battle, or a combination of them. The possibilities are limitless. You will probably spend quite a bit of time here at the screen deciding on what to pick. You will see some red classes at the bottom of the list. These are classes you cannot pick at level 1, but if you meet the requirements, you can level into these classes later on after you have the requirements met. For the sake of this guide, let's say I wanted to pick a druid druid, because it's the best. I can be a standard druid, or I can be one of her archetypes. Every archetype has pros and cons from the base class. In the case of a drovier, I can scroll down and see that I have lost the ability to wild shape, but I gain the ability communal aspect. If you are considering taking an archetype, at least skim what you gain and lose to see if you are okay with that selection. I'm going to accept being a standard druid and move on to the race and gender selection. Gender has no effect on stats, pick whatever you wish. Now, some classes have racial restrictions on race. For example, the Cavalier's Cavalier of the Paw archetype has to be a halfling, but for our druid we can be what we want. Now, you can choose the thing you want to look like, or you can min-max. If you plan to do the latter, you need to understand what stats you care about. For example, our halfling friend here has less strength but more dexterity and charisma than the average person. Now, what stats does our druid care about? Now, Pathfinder is very good with tooltips tips, and you can read all of this, but I'm going to give you a brief summary. Strength affects your chance to hit and how hard you hit in melee combat, as well as affecting some skill checks that involve physical activity. I'll explain skill checks soon, but know it increases your chances of success for now. This is very important if you wish to fight somebody up close. Dexterity is a measure of your agility and reflexes. Important for people doing precise ranged attacks, this includes archers, as well as wizards firing lasers out of their hands. Also makes you more agile during combat, meaning you are harder to hit and helpful for skills that would require finesse, such as picking a lock or a pocket. Constitution is how healthy you are. This affects your hit points and your ability to resist things like poison and disease. Intelligence determines how well your character learns and reasons, affects how many skills your character can have, and is crucial for most alchemists, arcanists, witches, magi, and wizards for how many spells they can use per day. Wisdom measures your willpower, common sense, awareness, and intuition. This affects your ability to resist things that attack your willpower power, such as mind control, spotting hidden things such as treasures, passageways, and other skills. Vital for clerics, druids, inquisitors, war priests, hunters, shamans, and rangers for their spell casting abilities. Charisma is often thought of as how beautiful someone is, but it is much more than that. It is also a measure of the force of your personality, your ability to lead and convince people. It is used in persuasion checks and using some magical equipment. It is used by clerics and paladins when they try to overwhelm the undead with their channel energy skill, and used by bards, paladins, blood ragers, oracles, skulls, and sorcerers to determine how many spells they can use. So, as a druid, I need wisdom for my spells. If I want to fire arrows when I am not casting magic, then I could spend some points on dexterity. If I want to engage in melee when I am not casting, then perhaps I'll spend points in strength. Con is a great leftover stat. Bonus hit points helps anybody, and I probably don't need to worry about int and charisma for this character. Each race starts with certain stats changes, like these for a halfling, or the ability to add something of your choice, such as with a human who can pick plus two to any score they wish. Additionally, your heritage can play a role here. Let's pick an Asimar for this example. An Asimar is a human descended from an angel or other heavenly being. I can only assume that their great-granddad or grandma was a bard with a very high charisma rating. If you choose Asimar, you then choose what type of heavenly creature you had in your bloodline, which then gives you stats 
stat and skill bonuses. Here I see that Garuda Heritage gives bonuses to Dexterity and Wisdom and a few other things. I'm going to grab that, get the wisdom I need, and I'll use that Dexterity for some archery practice. Next, you choose a background. This is a bit of flavor for your character. What have you done in the past up to this point? I'd like to be able to use bows or get a bonus to them if my character already had access to that weapon type. After flipping through many of the options, I found Hunter, which allows me to use short bows and long bows. Perfect. I'll take this one and move on. Next, we have our ability points. Once again, I'm going to take Wisdom for Druid spells, some Dexterity to shoot a bow when I'm not doing Druid magic, and some Constitution doesn't hurt for more hit points. You may notice if you try to pour many points into one stat, the points become more expensive. For example, raising my wisdom from 19 to 20 here took four ability points away, so you can choose to be incredibly good at one thing or decently good at many. I opted to go with this and you'll notice I actually reduced my charisma to squeeze out a bit more of what I wanted. You can do that. If you have a stat you don't want or you think would be interesting to be bad at a certain thing, you can reduce that stat and put the points elsewhere. You'll also notice the little green thumbs up, the game trying to tell you that for the druid's selection I made, this thing is important. Let's quickly talk about modifiers. To the right of my 20 wisdom, you'll see it says plus 5 to the modifier. That means when I do anything that is based on wisdom, it will add 5 to it. The modifier will change every even point in a stat. A good way of thinking about it is that a perfectly average person in the Pathfinder world would have 10 to every stat with a modifier of 0. Less than 10 means a negative modifier, like my charisma currently is, and more than 10 means a positive modifier. So if I try to convince someone to do something with persuasion, which is based on charisma, that minus one will make things more difficult. Next up is skills. Certain classes will have access to a massive amount of skill points to each level. Druids only get a few, plus more if you spend a lot of points on your intelligence. The green marker in the class skill category means that you get a bonus to it after spending a point on it. You'll notice my perception jumps from six to 10 with one point in it. That's because of the class skill bonus bonus. I recommend sticking to class skills on your character. No one character can be good at every single thing. That's why we have a party to back us up. You'll look for party members that are good at what you lack later on. Another thing to notice while mousing over perception is that it is getting a large bonus from my wisdom. You can mouse over each skill yourself if you wish to, but every skill gets a bonus from an ability score, such as wisdom for perception, strength for athletics, etc. I'm going to choose perception as one of my skills as that is used a lot in the Pathfinder universe for spotting hidden enemies, passages, troves of treasure, etc. Athletics and lore nature I am taking because... Honestly, it feels druidy. Shut up. After choosing skills, we choose a feat, or possibly even feats depending on your earlier selections. For example, humans start with an extra feat. A feat in Pathfinder is kind of like a talent choice in other games. It unlocks something new. Certain classes such as fighters get additional feats very often. Most classes get one every two levels or so. Feats can give you access to new things such as weapons or armor you couldn't use before, such as martial weapons proficiency or heavy armor proficiency. Bonuses in certain situations, such as dodge, giving you an additional point to your total armor class. Or alleviate negative effects, such as blind fight, allowing you to still be a decent fighter in a situation where you are in the dark or blinded. Now, I could take combat casting, allowing me to more easily get spells off while someone is punching me in the face, but I plan to do most of my casting before a fight if possible, buff magic and the like, and be using a bow in combat. So I'm going to take point blank shot for some boost to my archery. Also note that at this screen, we can see what other feats will show up later due to taking this feat. You could stay at the screen for a few minutes looking at options to plan future choices. I think this is a good moment to point out that your character can be retrained at a future NPC if you have regrets on your choices and you wish to do so. This is done at a certain NPC in a certain tavern. I won't spoil it any more than that. Next, you may get some more selection screens based off your choices so far. As a druid, I choose a domain to channel or an animal friend. I am going to be picking up an animal friend to help me out. A note about animal companions. If they are at least one size category larger than you, you can use most of them as a mount. For example, a small halfling can use a medium-sized raptor as a mount, or a medium human can use a horse, which starts at size large, as a mount. Also, many of the animals grow in size at certain level ups. Now, I find the Smilodons especially deadly, as it can do one bite and four claw attacks in a single round of combat. If you aren't playing on turn-based mode, a round is about six seconds of time. After 
afterward, you choose a deity or lack thereof. This choice heavily impacts classes that get their powers from a higher power, such as clerics and paladins, and has a minor impact on the others. You will also get certain bonuses with weapons. Certain deities will only notice you if you are within their alignment, such as good, evil, lawful, to name a few. I'm going to choose Aristil, who is basically the god of the hunt. Pressing next, the game will kindly overlap all of your choices so far and tell me that I can start as either a good neutral character or a lawful neutral character. This is because a druid is always neutral in some way, shape, or form, and the god Aristil had his own requirements, which leaves us these options. I could still turn to the dark side later on if I wanted, or go back and change something in character creation. Some classes, such as a fighter, are far more flexible. After all, you can picture a warrior in any army, good or evil. I chose neutral good for this tune, and continued on to the character design. We've reached appearance customization. Make yourself gorgeous. Or not. Choose a voice actor, male or female. Doesn't have to be the same gender you chose if you want to go crazy. Hi, honey. Choose a name and press enter, then a birthday if you wish. Next, we come to your final character sheet. Let's simplify this. The top right are your skills. You've already seen this. Top left are your ability scores. In the middle are your special abilities. Some of these are buttons anyone can use, such as saddle up to mount a companion. And I'm referring to things like horses, so get your mind out of the gutter, as well as Coupe de Gracie. Coup de Grace. Other skills are based on your character choices. Scrolling down, you'll see your feats, traits, and spells that your class gets at level 1. Now I'm going to fast forward a bit into the game to when I have some gear equipped to explain a few things on this sheet. Let's start with attack and damage. Attack is basically your chance to hit, and damage is how much damage did you do. When you attempt to attack, the game will roll a 20-sided die, a d20, and add your attack to it. If the total beats the enemy's armor class, your armor class is down here, then the attack hits and the damage is rolled after. If your attack roll is a 1, you always miss, and a 20 is always a hit and possibly even a critical strike. Your flat-footed armor class is what your armor is when you are caught by surprise or haven't had a turn yet. Flat-footed will still count the gear you are wearing, but not the bonuses from dexterity. Imagine if you are wearing a tin can, you are still protected, but if your defenses are based on seeing the enemy and dodging them, you lose that. Touch armor is the opposite. If some wizard is trying to touch you with a palm full of lightning, you wearing full plate mail doesn't make you any harder to hit with that but those dexterity bonuses do. Fortitude is used to fight off diseases and poisons, reflex for avoiding something unexpected, such as a trap that fires an arrow at you, and will is used to resist attacks on your mind. Your speed is usually 30, but may be smaller if you have little legs, such as halflings, or greater if you have certain buffs or bonuses. Also, a reminder that when you level up, you can put another level into the same class, or you can put it somewhere else. So a level 2 character could be a level 1 bard and a level 1 fighter. If you choose to do this, I recommend picking classes that use the same primary stats, such as Strength and Intelligence. This character shown here is a level 8, but it has 4 levels in Paladin and 4 levels in Fighter Tower Shield Specialist. If you choose to play a class that has to prepare their spells, you will want to press B once in the game to open your spell books. The list of spells you have access to are on the right, and your available slots are on the left. You can prepare the same spell multiple times if you wish to use it more than once. After they have been dragged over, you will need to rest to have them locked and loaded. You can change them before your next rest if you wish. Some casters will have far less spells to choose from, but will not have to prepare them. To access the spells you chose, press the S above your hotbar and you can cast them from here. They are divided by tier. Or you can drag them down to the hotbar if you use them often. The A is for abilities and the B is for items that you have stored in your belt right here in the inventory window. I have so much more to teach, but I am starting to segue out of the topic of this video, which was character creation. So I'm going to stop there for this one. I hope this helps clear up any confusion you might have had with the Pathfinder D. 20 system. If you like this video, please consider leaving a like for the YouTube algorithm. And if you have any questions, problems, thoughts, or concerns, let me know in the comments down below and subscribe for more similar content.